Okay, guys, we're going to start the second talk. Um, we are very lucky. Uh, we said we had a cancellation of one of our other planned talks. I'll let you know this. I'm very happy for Chris and um, Kim, who has offered kindly to step in uh, and this is a ticket bullet for us. Uh, so, Chris uh, is you know, one of the principal programmers here at Formation, um, and he's going to be talking about Haskell Design Pattern in machine learning. Um, so, Chris will tell us much more about this. Thank you. Um, yeah, I was just mentioning, so this is talking to you, it's killed at a bay about a month or so ago to like a very different audience. Uh, so we'll see how it goes here. Um, so I, uh, like I said, I'm an engineer at Formation um, uh, Startup, uh, and we apply um, reinforcement learning, which is a, a certain type of uh, machine learning to uh, large customer reward programs in order to try and um, uh, personalized sort of customer relationships over longer periods of time. Um, so it's a fairly like challenging machine learning environment and we'll talk a little bit about um, some of the design patterns we use to um, help organize our code. Um, so um, like maybe a best practices talk or something like that. Um, <clears throat> Um, best practices in machine learning are, are pretty uh, nebulous. I think machine learning engineering has been around for all of that long. Um, so <laughs> most of this is, uh, I guess, opinionated take. Um, and even the criteria uh, for, for good machine learning engineering are, are up for debate. Um, certainly uh, one criterion you might be tempted to apply is uh, correctness, um, good correct. Uh, unfortunately, for many types of machine learning, this is an um, underdefined or even undefinable concept. Uh, so, for example, uh, recommender systems, um, there's, there's no real notion of, of correctness that, that uh, you can apply. Um, another uh, criterion that, that comes to mind quickly is performance, which of course is important, but it's certainly not uh, the most important. Um, Testability is definitely important and probably up there uh, for me. And we do uh, uh, use a fair amount of like property-based testing. Um, we do hedgehog in our code, including for properties that are um, uh, asymptotic in nature, so related to the convergence of different things. Uh, I won't be talking about that much um, because I think uh, there's, there's something even more important for me anyway uh, at this job, which is maintainability. Um, so, uh, you know, how, how quickly can you um, change your mind about exactly what you're doing? Um, how easy is it to refactor things, to reapply code to a slightly different context? Um, we're a small startup, and like I said, we're trying to apply reinforcement learning to rewards programs, which is not an area where machine learning has been applied before. So, um, uh, ideas are bound to churn a lot, um, and it's important to uh, keep up with that. And so earlier this year, we had a real issue with maintainability. Um, and uh, this is sort of a talk about how we worked our way out of it. Um, and, and the issue we had is that we identified a simplified version of, of a reinforcement learning problem we we're trying to solve that we thought we could solve with uh, contextual planets, which is a, a fairly uh, simplistic type of reinforcement learning approach. And uh, there's a library that's pretty well known that handles it well called Bubble Wabbit. Um, out of Yahoo Research and Microsoft Research. And uh, some data scientists on our team were, were quite familiar um, with the library. So we started building bindings for it. And um, uh, we quickly realized that a lot of the stuff that we were building was very specialized about the web and it was sort of leaking out in, into adjacent services, um, configuration uh, types and that kind of thing. Um, uh, so it turns out this is like an anti-pattern that's that's been um, commented on before, probably most notably by some engineers at Google. Um, so this is a well-known paper uh, that they wrote, and um, one of the anti-patterns they define in it. Um, yeah, it's kind of an amusing title. Uh, one of the anti-patterns that they define in it is is called like the glue code pattern. Um, so uh, essentially um, lots of framework specific code, in this case, the Valpo Abbott framework, um, building up around it and making it difficult to, to change your mind about what, you know, how you're gonna use a machine learning framework or even what machine learning framework you might use. Um, uh, and the, the paper has a, a solution um, 
to this anti-pattern, which is um, <laughs> just re-implement the algorithm yourself uh, in your language of choice in your particular architecture, um, which I think is terrible advice for a startup anyway. Um, uh, it, in our particular case, uh, Valpa Labit, you know, it's a fairly complex um, piece of code solving a fairly complex machine learning algorithm, it's maybe 8,000 commits. Um, and even if we re-implemented it, um, there's no guarantee that the problem we'd be facing in in months would be the same as the one that we have now. So that wasn't really on the table for us. Um, but uh, common engineering practices certainly were. So um, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how um, we use Haskell's type system um, to provide interfaces that make sense around two frameworks, um, Bubble Added and TensorFlow. Um, and uh, I'll show um, the kind of application at the end. Um, so uh, one of the patterns that we use a lot is called the handle pattern. And um, unfortunately, I was saying this right before the talk, uh, design patterns in Haskell, um, at least for uh, you know, industry or whatever, real world applications aren't um, codified in a uh, very formal way. There's a lot of them live in the blogosphere. Um, and I have a couple links at the end of these slides, um, which are on, on GitHub, so you can um, follow them. But uh, a lot of the, the patterns that you do hear about are um, based on, on mathematical formalisms, um, uh, you know, um, functor monad, applicative functor algebra, um, con extension, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and those are beautiful, and you should totally use them if you can. Unfortunately, when you're uh, dealing with machine learning uh, frameworks, usually you're stuck in I.O. Um, these things are using form function interfaces to see your C++ libraries much of the time, so you're exception prone. Um, and you need to account for that. Um, so the handle pattern um, essentially allows you to uh, create handle, which is some uh, uh, data type or structure that contains um, arbitrary functions, oftentimes, or IO refs or, or um, STM chans or whatnot. Um, it allows you to encapsulate or hide state, um, manipulate the state, um, and uh, configure, create, and destroy handles. So if, if you were to um, replace uh, you know, handle with object and function with method, this would sound a little bit like object-oriented programming. Uh, but um, in practice, you'll see it, it's not quite like that. Um, but uh, it is extremely useful um, when you're, as I said, dealing with IO or, or monad type classes close to IO. Um, so here's a handle that's the main subject of the talk, and it represents uh, a machine learning model that's been loaded into memory, um, and it's parameterized on five type variables. So I is a, a training input, um, so that's some data that, that is labeled in some fashion and is pr provided the model for the purposes of, of uh, training it. J is a scoring input. Uh, so a labelless uh, input that would be provided at, at serving time or scoring time. O is the output. Um, e is an, is an error type, um, uh, which uh, you'll see, you know, we may, we may use for uh, an early stopping in a stochastic gradient descent process. Um, and uh, M is, is a, a monadic parameter, and so we'll be applying um, various constraints on M, um, as you'll see. Uh, so if that's the handle, this is uh, the sort of, in the OO analogy, the handle factory. Um, so I, I have a type class here called um, model config, um, which takes some configuration type C. And in fact, it's a type family, um, which is, if you're not familiar, like a, a slightly more powerful kind of type class that allows you to um, actually define types that depend on, on the configuration type parameter here, C. Uh, so a lot of people um, sometimes describe type families as, as type level functions, and you can kind of see that here where I've defined this convenience type model handle prime, which essentially applies the type handle or applies the type level function. So I have an input type C um, for learning, one for scoring, one for the output, one for the error. 
Um, and then I, I also have another type, um, which isn't present in the model handle, but uh, I need to destroy my handle. Um, and uh, note that, put it on the slide, but um, my monadic parameter here is not part of this type family. It's not, it's not being determined uh, by the input. Um, and that's good. We want that because I, I want to separately put these constraints on the monad to, to sort of describe what the environment can and can't do that this uh, handle is living inside of. Um, <clears throat> so that's, that's the basic um, type family. And then uh, in addition, I'm going to supply two functions, one to create a handle and one to destroy a handle. Um, and so the creation function will take a configuration and then in this monadic context produce a, a tuple, um, uh, where one is the handle itself um, and the second part is uh, uh, some piece of code that's going to destroy the handle when I'm ready. Um, and uh, of course, delete will take that piece of code and then go ahead and deallocate the resources. Um, and then here, finally, are um, uh, a couple of those constraints I described earlier. So this is definitely going to be an I.O. I, I don't really have any models that are pure Haskell code. We're mostly using frameworks. So um, that's the reason for that constraint. And because uh, these frameworks are all C++ for the most part, um, they can throw exceptions at any time um, asynchronously. Uh, so I want to be able to catch them and um, clean up after them. And that's what Monad Mask is for. Um, uh, so here's a, an example uh, uh, function that, that might live in the, the high-level API um, around that, that uh, type family. So, um, and this is, follows what's uh, commonly known as Haskell, in Haskell's the, the bracket pattern. So I've got um, a configuration uh, that I'm going to pass to it, and then uh, uh, I have some piece of code that's going to take the, the handle and act on it in some way. So it could call score a whole bunch of times, it could train it and then test it on some holdout. Um, uh, whatever it's going to do, it, it, it will eventually generate a result and, and this function is going to return that result. Um, and so what does this function do exactly? Well, uh, it, it calls that, that type families create model handle. Um, and uh, it uses that to allocate the handle. Um, and then the second argument is a function to delete the handle. Um, and recall that the, the allocation function actually returns a tuple, right? The first part was the handle and the second was the finalizer. So to destroy it, I'm going to pull the finalizer out of the tuple and then pass the result to the deletion function. Um, and I need uh, what's called a type application here um, because the delete model handle itself doesn't ever see um, C uh, in, in bare form. I mean, it sees C inside of things, but uh, in order to give Haskell like a power to ability to infer the correct type of C, I use a public type application. Um, and then finally, uh, I'm going to pull the handle out and um, pass it to the, the action um, and return the result. So that, that, uh, I'm going to talk real fast, and if I talk fast enough, um, in the last slide of this talk, we're going to see this function. Uh, and of course, the yeah, bracket itself is um, a fairly well-known function that, that appears in Haskell in different contexts. Uh, and I, oh, I should say, here, here's where that monad uh, mask restraint is needed. Um, okay, so how might I um, configure a handle for real? We'll, we'll look at a TensorFlow um, example. So. I'm going to just make a really simple uh, one variable linear regression model. So A equals MX plus B. Um, and to do that, um, I'm going to wrap a, you know, a framework level configuration type. Um, and uh, I'm going to define my inputs and outputs here. And so uh, for, on the input side, I'm going to um, actually pull uh, floats from within um, a TensorFlow model. So I'll just make a type alias for that. And, um, because it's a, um, a single variable linear regression, um, in order to train it, I need tuples of, you know, X and Y, right? Um, and if I were to just run this model in scoring mode, I don't need the Y. I just take the X, so that's why that type looks like that. And then um, I'm going to just pull regular floats out uh, of this handle. Uh, so I don't want to pass it to any more tensor flow code when I'm done. I just want the float to do something else with elsewhere in the code base. 
Um, and then the error for a linear model, as you would expect, would be you know, the square of the difference between the actual y and the y that you thought um, y had. Can I interrupt uh, just a yeah. question? So um, how specific is this to TensorFlow? If I wanted to throw away TensorFlow, um, how much work would it be to adapt? I mean, that... Almost none, as you'll see. Um, VW is in many ways the complete opposite of TensorFlow, and we can still fit it in. Okay. So, so TensorFlow has a concept of a session, but other frameworks don't, so you still have to adapt to that. So. Yeah, um, funny you should mention that. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, TensorFlow is the concept of a session. Um, a session itself is a, a, a reader T of IO type of monad or a reader T of M. Um, the, the environment for the reader is a session state, which itself is, is highly mutable. Um, but uh, essentially, um, what it's consuming is a, a state monad over um, a graph state. And the graph represents all the different nodes um, that you put together. So, you know, imagine adding two tensors and multiplying by a tensor, applying a conf net to some tensor. Um, all of those have dependencies, and uh, those are all codified in this graph. And I can construct this graph um, in a pure fashion inside of the state monad, and that will represent my model um, at a level of abstraction. Uh, it's purely descriptive. Um, and then I can execute it inside the session. So uh, in order to make my model handle, I don't need the, the session itself. I can just do that inside the build monad. Um, and uh, the way I'll do that is um, I'm going to, uh, this is very sort of C++ style, but it's leaked into the Haskell bindings that we're, or I'm using for this example anyway. So I want to make sure that the, uh, the, the size of the training input I'm thinking is variable. I don't want to encode that in the model itself, so I'll make sure that's variable. Um, and then uh, I need um, my X's and my Y's, so uh, I'll define placeholders for those. Um, the actual weights that represent this model are the slope and the intercept. So I'm going to initialize TensorFlow variables for those. The model itself is defined by a fairly um, simple ex you know, expression, y equals mx plus b. Um, my loss function consists of, as I mentioned, the square of the difference. Um, and then the, the handle I'm going to build out of a score function, um, an error function, and a learn function, where uh, the score and the error are simply um, uh, me rendering um, the the loss and the um, the y hat, and then in order to train this, um, uh, this is a, a pretty simple model. So I'll just go ahead and use basic gradient descent, and I'll I'll give it a step size. This were a more complex model, I, I wouldn't want this in the build graph. I'd probably um, reify this elsewhere in some sort of configuration um, that I would read in. Um, and then uh, I can minimize uh, the, the two variables that are going to be changing during the SGD process, and that'll be my learn. I ran out of room, but basically the rest of it is just taking learn prime, score prime, and error prime, sticking them in the handle. Yeah. Why is a uh, y hat called y hat? Is that a, a convention? Uh, uh, yeah. Science, data science. Uh, old statistics okay. convention. Yeah. Um, but to differentiate it from y, which is the sort of ground truth, yeah. and y hat is the, the, the model's inferred value. Yeah. Um, so uh, that's nice. Um, VW, uh, almost a sort of other end of the universe when it comes to uh, machine learning frameworks. Um, why is that? Uh, well, VW is, is um, entirely configured at the command line. Um, uh, which is um, convenient, I guess, if you're a researcher um, from an engineering perspective, it's kind of horrifying, especially when you have a lot of complex stuff under the hood. So this is um, a VW command line um, that's, that's doing a, a kind of simple sort of recommender system based on matrix factorization. Uh, and so I, you know, I'm uh, defining the number of bits in the array that, uh, consists of that, that uh, holds the weights. I'm applying some um, uh, fairly non-trivial feature engineering here. So I'm taking like one set of values and I'm multiplying them quadratically with another set of values, generating a bunch of quadratic values. Um, I'm limiting the, the weight, or I'm sorry, the rank of the latent space. I'm taking a big matrix and I'm making a product of a tall fat and a, um, 
uh, or sorry, it's all skinny in a short fat matrix. Um, and uh, you know, in order to do that, I'm going to run SGD with a certain learning rate for a certain number of passes, and the DK of the learning rate, blah 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 blah. Um, and uh, the use case that I, I'm actually most interested in, um, because I work here, is a contextual bandit use case. And so this is the use case that, that we're actually going to productionize in the next like 20, 30 slides. Um, so uh, a contextual bandit is um, a, a simple kind of reinforcement learning agent that um, looks at uh, what's called a context um, and then picks between a number of actions. Um, so uh, the initial um, uh, term bandit came from a model called a one-armed bandit and then a multi-armed bandit. Um, and one-armed bandits were an old-timey term for a slot machine. So the multi-armed bandit problem was uh, consists of a number of different slot machines with different um, uh, expected values on the return, different variances, and you have a bucket of quarters, and you need to go maximize your return on your finite bucket of quarters. And so you could just go to the first slot machine you see and just bang every quarter in there and keep pulling, um, but that wouldn't necessarily be a very um, optimizing uh, approach to take. So you have to sort of uh, trade off between exploring the different um, machines and when you find one that, that seems to be um, returning a lot, um, exploiting it, right? Uh, so um, the, the version of uh, VW that we use a fair amount is called um, uh, contextual bandit with um, action-dependent features, which just simply means that um, these slot machines themselves um, have uh, uh, some features. So you could imagine, um, sorry to put this back into the uh, slot machine uh, or, or um, casino analogy um, feature might be like a uh, year it was made um, combined with uh, you know how loud it is uh, or where it's placed on the floor um, and, and the overall shared context might be uh, which casino you're in. So in some casinos you might choose to go to the machines all the way against the wall that are quietest because those are the ones that have to pay out the most and others. Um, and um, again, I'm, I'm defining a lot at the, at the command line here. So I'm, I'm defining an exploration algorithm. Uh, I'm defining like a, a location for an input training set. Um, and I'm going to write out a bunch of predictions to a prediction file and um, some errors to an error file. And then uh, this is just going to um, run a stochastic gradient descent process um, and, and log everything as we go. Uh, is everyone familiar with stochastic gradient descent for about high level? Okay. okay. Uh, just to briefly recap, um, so from single variable calculus, if you were to try and find a, a critical point of a function, um, uh, one simple thing to do is, um, so a critical point recall is a point where the first derivative is zero. Um, and if the function is um, convex, uh, then you'll know that um, that's a unique uh, minimum. Um, so if I have a convex function that defines the, the sort of training of a machine learning algorithm, then I can start anywhere and look at the derivative and just take a step in uh, the, the negative direction of the gradient. I'm guaranteed to be headed down towards some global minimum. That's you guys pretty simple. Um, so, okay, uh, back to your comment. So. Um, VW is very, very different um, in the sense that I don't have a build graph. Uh, I, I don't have um, a rich section which consists of a monad transformer stack um, with access to lots of different things. All I really have is a pointer and a C++ memory, uh, which I'll call a session. And a typical thing in Haskell is to model a pointer with a um, sort of opaque uh, um, or dead uh, uh, variable. And uh, I'm going to um, uh, extract the following uh, four things. So I've got my pointer, um, I've got uh, prediction types and label types, and these are both um, uh, some types or enums and maybe a dozen different things each. Uh, and then um, my options are, are a byte string and they, they literally are exactly the, these things, just like a byte string of <laughs> command line flags. Um, and so with that I can uh, uh, also define um, an example. So this is the sort of VW analog of a tensor. And again, it's just a uh, opaque type and a pointer into C++ memory. 
Um, and when I have those two, I can define some pretty basic um, functions. So this would be part of the foreign function interface. Um, I, won't, I won't go into the implementations. Come brutal, but um, basically uh, the way I create a session, I pass you know the equivalent of command line arguments, um, and then inside I/O I, I have some sort of handle, and I can delete my session. And if I have a session and a byte string that consists of a line of data, uh, then I can pull out a handle to an example, um, and I, I can uh, clean up the example. So when I have those two things, um, I can also do the following. Uh, uh, I can learn on the example, or I can predict. Both of those have the same type signature. Um, so the actual way that I, I extract a prediction, um, uh, I'll, I'll show you in a minute. And then the last thing I can do is um, grab some um, statistics uh, out of the current model. And I'm, I'm going to end up plugging this into that error function I showed you earlier. Uh, so um, I can I can bracket my create my deletes on both the session level and the example level, and now I have enough to be dangerous. Basically, uh, so like uh, with this pretty simple set, I can um, uh, create uh, something that consumes a um, an action that might learn or predict, consumes some kind of extractor, and then a list of data, and then produces a list of outputs. Um, and so the way I'll do that is just use those functions I defined earlier. So I'll pass my options byte string, this guy, to uh, my with session bracket, which that'll hand me a session handle. And with that session handle, I can loop over all the, the pieces of data. Um, and for each piece of data, I can pass the session and the data to my example uh, bracket, which will then give me an example handle. And I can take this action here pass the session and the example, do whatever, learn or predict, or predict, learn and then predict, and then um, extract the example. Uh, so that's a, that's a function I can make. Um, and if I were to actually run this at the command line, um, here's what it might look like. So here's some data. Uh, this is fairly peculiar looking. Uh, I'm sure that's because VW uses libSVM's old uh, data format. libSVM is a uh, very old uh, by modern standards uh, uh, machine learning framework. Um, and uh, basically, uh, it creates a, the labels on the left side of the bar. These things define namespaces. These are um, pieces of data. Uh, here are my options. Um, so you can see S and T define namespaces, and my dash Q, as I mentioned, I'm going to quadratically combine everything. So I'm going to end up multiplying the by un and the by om, man by un and man by om. And I'm going to make sure my model is not constant. So uh, this is just arbitrary. Um, and then I, uh, I'm going to learn on my session and my example, and then I'm going to predict that'll be my action. Uh, and then uh, I'll extract a scalar prediction. Um, and, and if I look at the type of that, it just pulls out a float inside I.O. Uh, so what happens when I run this, um, uh, I get uh, see a list of size 1. Um, and this float is between 0 and 1, which is not ac no accident, because if I don't tell it otherwise, VW assumes I'm training a logistic regression model, because of course. Uh, and if I run this a bunch of times, um, it'll uh, gradually get closer and closer to 1, because uh, I'm learning on the data, and I only have one line of data, so I'm overfitting it, and it thinks the result's one, so I get closer and closer and closer to a model that just always thinks everything is one. Um, so, uh, that's not great for a number of reasons, um, it, for actually uh, building a, a large set of um, uh, you know, startup level tooling on. Um, and, and the reason it's not great, um, in case it wasn't obvious, is uh, the sort of opaqueness of the options byte string and the opaqueness of the um, input byte string. Because uh, the inputs could be any one of, um, you know, as I said, a dozen different types. And the options, um, when considering all the different combinations, is, you know, well into the thousands. Um, and they don't all work together, right? If I pass, some inputs with some option flag set, um, I'm going to get um, a runtime error. Um, so one way that I can um, 
uh, start to lock that down with the type system is uh, just simply note that this is written in a very continuation passing style, right? Um, uh, I'm feeding three layers of continuations to these functions. So uh, if I look at that and I look at the fact that um, uh, I'm going to be stuck with these types quite a bit um, just because of the nature of the framework I'm working with, and in particular, this sort of example to IO of something is coming up a couple times. Um, I can extract that in, in what's called a, a continuation monad transformer, um, which simply uh, uh, takes a, a continuation and sort of wraps it in this uh, const t type. Um, what is a continuation? A continuation uh, is simply uh, um, a type that, that takes a function from e to m of o, where m is generally some monad, and then gives you an m of o. Um, which uh, is a lot like having an E um, in the first place. And uh, if you're familiar with like UNATA lemma, it'll tell you exactly under what conditions you have an E, as opposed to sort of having an E. Um, we don't exactly have an E, we sort of have an E here. But if we were to specialize this type to the things that matter to us, um, we'd see uh, something that looks pretty similar to that type of signature um, that I showed you in the last slide. Um, and if I uh, compare that to that uh, with example um, bracket that I made earlier, you can see this type looks like the sort of second half of the with example. Um, so I, I can go ahead and um, uh, formalize that with this little pattern that, that consumes a session and then um, uh, partially binds with example to it and feeds the result in the comp T. And um, instead of uh, this part of the end, I'll, I'll end up with my comp t. So this is like the basic type that I want to work with, um, and I can I can uh, make a type alias for that. Um, and uh, funnily enough, uh, this will turn out to be really similar to uh, code density monad if you're familiar with that. Um, so uh, I want to um, uh, serialize things. Uh, let me just go back for one second. Uh, this function here, you can see, uh, once I pass a session to it, then um, I'm going to take some arbitrary byte string and I'm going to serialize it into an example, do something with that example, and then this is going to give me back the result. Uh, so if I call that a serializer, then this is a function that produces a serializer, and uh, I can confirm that it does nothing with the output by um, uh, putting this universal um, modifier on it. So um, uh, this just simply means that um, I, I can't, the implementation of this function can't uh, do anything that's particular to any particular type of, right? Um, and so this, this looks a lot like a code entity. Uh, and um, I can codify the other pattern um, by uh, lifting it um, into this hole that I've defined. And once I have that, um, I, can, I can go back and rewrite process lines. And it's not going to look that different. In fact, this doesn't really look like much of an improvement to me, but I'm after fa fairly complex behavior. So, for example, um, uh, for the ADF case that I mentioned, that, that action dependent feature case, I actually have. Um, a pair of example pointers, not just one. And I'm going to consume um, a non-empty vector of byte, byte strings. So it's just like a list of byte strings that's guaranteed to, to have something in it. And um, these two things interact in a sort of perverse way. So I mentioned that um, the ADF model uh, has a sort of global context, which represented maybe which casino you're in, and then a bunch of action uh, dependent context, which maybe represents like the sort of age of the machine or something. And so what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to serialize the global context. I'm going to learn the global context. And then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to serialize uh, all of the features for each action. And then I'm going to learn on all of the features for each action. And then finally, I'm going to, uh, at the end, I'm going to uh, serialize uh, an empty string um, which is going to sort of bind all of the, the action stuff together, and then I'm going to return the, the, the example pointer from the global context and, and the sort of bound example pointer together. Um, and, and this would be uh, uh, 
sort of a little more verbose and, and crappy to try and um, specify uh, at the, the FFI level. Um, so uh, that's nice. And even more importantly, um, I can go ahead and define um, uh, conditions for, for producing a model that's going to feed a handle. So the learn function um, better not produce anything, right? It better just simply learn. Um, the serializer um, for the learn functions, that's what's going to take the input and um, produce an example to learn on, uh, had better not um, be uh, opinionated about the output it's producing. Um, and then same for the score function, um, except instead of producing nothing, it's going to produce um, outputs and it's going to consume a, a slightly different type of input. Um, and so once I have all that together, um, I can go ahead and I can make another instance of my model config type class um, and uh, feed all this to it. Um, and in, in this case, I'm not inside of, uh, like a fancy TensorFlow session monad. It's going to be inside I.O. Um, the finalizer is um, going to be the same for every model. Statistics. And I, I can talk a little bit more about how I produce that, but I kind of want to rush and do something slightly more interesting. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about um, some code that we wrote to train models um, on top of uh, EMR or uh, Elastic MapReduce. Um, and he, actually, Ian wrote a lot of those codes. So you can ask him if you're curious about it. Um, so uh, uh, using handles. Um, and one quick preface uh, pattern that we use in this is called the has pattern. Um, so uh, if you're familiar with lenses from, from I don't know, either the theory or commits library, uh, uh, often they're associated with type classes. Um, so if I have uh, a foo type and then a has foo uh, of s, which would simply be a, a lens prime from s to foo, um, ditto for prisms. Um, you could weaken that slightly um, to uh, get foo with a getter, which is essentially the lens equivalent of a function from s to foo. Um, and we're going to use a, a slightly more general function of that, where instead of a foo, I'm going to parameterize over the um, the target type um, and uh, the domain type as well. So that you just think of get AS as a function from S to A. Um, and you'll see why that's pretty handy in a moment. Um, so the next, like, this is the last 10 or 12 slides. And uh, I'm going to show you a lot of code, but uh, just try and stay focused. I think the thing that I'm trying to um, sort of, uh, gesture at the most is the, um, the constraints that we create. and. Um, how they um, uh, get you exactly what you want out of each function um, without being so overly opinionated that the function doesn't become useful for other adjacent use cases. Um, OK, so uh, we're going to train a, a stochastic gradient descent. Uh, we're going to train a model with stochastic gradient descent. I need a harness for that. Uh, and uh, my harness needs to do two things. It needs to um, have a learn step um, and like a scoring step. So. Recall, you know, when we have our um, sort of parabola or whatever convex function and we start at some point on the parabola, um, I need to start taking steps one at a time. You know, compute the gradient, take a step in the negative direction of the gradient, uh, recheck, recompute the gradient. And um, every time I take a step, or maybe I want to take nine steps uh, and then I'm going to check my score, uh, or maybe I want to take one step and then check my score. Um, but Regardless of how I configure it, um, every once in a while, I need to stop learning and assess my model against some kind of ground truth. Um, so how are we going to do that? Um, well, the first thing we need is uh, some notion of a loss. Um, and then uh, once I have that, I can uh, create some, some kind of logger. Um, and uh, a logger uh, will consume a, a logging info type, which is just the number of examples it's seen. And then um, let's say the total aggregated model loss. Um, I could make a monoid out of this if I wanted to, but get too particular. Um, and then uh, because my model itself has um, uh, intrinsic notion of learner error, um, the way I'm going to log data is by um, taking a, a, a model handle, taking a training input, somehow combining those two, and then um, the logging info or learning info to that point, and then in the monadic context, updating the learning info. Um, <clears throat> and so here's one function that would put that together. Uh, so um, let's say I have uh, some notion of verbosity um, where I want to update this 
with some frequency. Um, and I can apply that to the um, uh, uh, learning logger that I have. Um, and if uh, it's time to update, you know, maybe I want to print out to the screen or write to uh, a log inside of AWS. Um, I can do that every in steps um, or else uh, uh, not touch it. Um, and in order to update it, uh, I'm going to call my, my model handles error function on the handle and the input. I'm going to use the, the get um, function that I, I'm guaranteed to have because I have this type class constraint. Um, and uh, then I can um, update my info type. I can log that. Uh, I won't tell you what this is. It doesn't really matter. It's just some I.O. function um, to write it somewhere and re return my log. And what's nice about this is um, uh, this, this function is going to work for all configuration types C and all monads M, where C has a model configuration, right? C can create a model. The model that C creates has an error type, and that error type has in it somewhere a loss, or at least there's a function that can consume that error type and generate a loss. Um, and that monad um, has access to I.O., or rather I.O. can be lifted into that monad. Um, so we're going to, with these kinds of constraints, um, create more and more complex um, behavior in this function. Uh, so uh, assuming you sort of know what conduit is, um, and we'll have a look at, at um, uh, some training that's fairly specific to reinforcement learning agent. Um, and to save myself some room on the slide, I'm just going to um, give myself a type alias for conduit. Um, is everyone sort of familiar with Conduit? A little bit. Uh, so Conduit is a, a, a Haskell library that um, uh, lets you handle streaming data. So um, you know, if I have a bunch of byte strings of some size coming in, maybe they're small, and I want to um, kind of lump them together and maybe write them to S3 buckets, a Conduit would be really nice for that. Um, so uh, it's a streaming library that's got fairly nice performance and, and memory characteristics can teach a lot in the industry. Um, so uh, uh, here's the first function I'll show you. Um, so uh, in order to actually uh, conduct one learning step, um, what do I need? Well, I need a, I need a model config. I need to be an I/O. Uh, if I have my handle and my logger, um, I can. Uh, grab um, the second part of the input. The first part is just going to be some index telling me what example I'm on. Uh, then I, uh, I actually have the, the training data in here. I know it's training data for sure, because it's um, guaranteed to be by this type level function uh, that's from my model config class. Uh, I'll learn on it. Um, I'm, in ex I'm in an exception monad, so I, I need to lift my result with the monad. Um, and then I'm going to uh, uh, pipe all of that, you could think of this a little bit like a Unix pipe, uh, into a, a function that just simply um, logs everything uh, once in a while and, and uh, uses the, the monad of the, the learning log to um, accumulate a sort of uh, learning logger. Um, and uh, uh, I won't worry too much about the types of the conduit combinators because I feel like I'll probably just either lose everyone or avoid them. Um, so just maybe keep things at a slightly higher level. Um, so um, once I have that, okay, I've got my learning step, but now I need to be able to score the model. Um, so I need to, some notion of how well it's doing. So every once in a while, I have to withhold the, the label on the training data and force it to guess and then assess the guess. right? Uh, and um, because I'm going uh, I'm gonna do the assessing outside of the framework, uh, I don't want to do the assessing inside the framework for a couple of reasons. One is I'd like to be able to um, uh, uh, compare models from different frameworks, one another, for example, um, and they may have different uh, ways of assessing performance uh, that are different from each other. Um, another one is uh, not every framework um, may have an obvious way of, of assessing. Um, for example, if I were to train a recommender system, so, um, uh, assessment might uh, be non-trivial, or in the you know full reinforcement learning case, assessment might involve simulating an entire environment and forcing the agent to sort of interact in that environment. 
Uh, so uh, I'm going to pull assessing out of the framework, which means that I don't need the model handle to do it. Um, and uh, uh, I'm going to create a constraint um, that represents my ability to, to hold out data. Um, so this is why I'm going to use a language extension called constraint kind of, uh, constraint kinds. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and this constraint simply consists of uh, uh, the fact that C must have a model configuration and uh, C's scoring input must be retrievable from C's training input in some sense. Um, so for the TensorFlow, that sort of a single variable regression model, the training input recall is just a tuple of two numbers, the input and the output. So the scoring input would just consist of drop, dropping the second number. That's really easy. Um, Right. If I have x and y, and I drop y now, I give you x, and you don't know what y is, you have to tell me. Um, for a, um, a contextual banded or a more complex reinforcement learning function, um, that, that would not be the case. It would be much more complicated, because in a reinforcement learning environment, you don't have labels. Like So, for example, with this multi-arm banded, if you go and you pull the arm of the third machine, you never know what would have happened if you pulled the arm of any other machine. Right. All you get is just this one result. Um, so that's a much more challenging machine learning environment. Um, uh, but I want to make sure I can handle that case here, um, which is why I need to, to sort of parameterize the relationship between the, the training input and the scoring input at this very high level. Um, so once I have that, um, I can introduce another type, um, which is uh, somewhat specific to reinforcement learning. Um, which simply says, uh, if, if I have the output, um, I must be able to extract some kind of action, right? Uh, if this is a reinforcement learner, it had to pick a machine, right? So somewhere in that output must be some notion of like, which thing did I do? Uh, and um, from the input, I need to get um, a, a special thing we call an ARP, uh, which is just the, the equivalent of the label, you could think. Um, it stands for action reward probability. Um, and uh, once I have that, uh, I can create my holdout function. Um, and now I have these new constraints here. Um, and the way I'm going to uh, pipe data into my holdout function is uh, first I'm going to call the score um, function. Score takes uh, the you know two poles where one is the index. Uh, so what step am I on? Uh, the second part is the data uh, because. I have um, inside my constraint a get instance that tells me how um, to get the training data or the scoring data from the training data. Recall I had to have that. I can now get my, my scoring data, pass it to my uh, score function on my handle, which has to be scoring data. Uh, I can lift the result into the monad, and then um, I can uh, return the action. Uh, and then I can uh, pipe all of that into um, an updater uh, and logger um, where uh, the updater looks like this. So um, uh, I've got now um, a three-pole instead of a two-pole. Um, so I've got the original training input and the um, uh, or, sorry scoring. Uh, no. Yeah, training input, scoring output, um, and I can uh, run an IPS function on it. So I'm going to um, I'm going to use this IPS constraint, um, which tells me that I must be able to get a certain kind of label out of the training input and a certain kind of like an action out of the, the output, um, and I can pass the action and the uh, label to IPS. Um, IPS stands for um, inverse propensity sampling, um, which is a way of uh, assessing um, certain kind of reinforcement learning data, which I won't dive into too much. But once I get the delta, I can append that to my scoring info um, and move on to the next one. Um, and uh, IPS, uh, recall, it's, this is where I'm actually using um, this IPS constraint. So the constraint consisted of two constraints. One was that I must be able to get um, uh, an arc from my input, and I must be able to get an action from my output. And if I can get those two things, then I can create actual loss. Um, and so when I put it all together, uh, so I've defined my, my training step and my scoring step, but I need to somehow combine them 
both to get the full stochastic gradient descent process. So uh, I'll create a, a strategy which simply tells, you know, uh, how many training steps do I want to take before I score the thing? Uh, maybe how long do I want to run this? Uh, and then two loggers, one for scoring, one for training. Um, and uh, once I uh, have that, then I, I get uh, almost to the end. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is start with the ID of zero. Um, I'm going to, um, uh, given my training strategy, I'm going to branch examples into either the sort of training route or the scoring route. So you can imagine I might train nine times and then score once and then train nine times and score once, which means inside of this conduit pipeline, you're going to see nine training inputs and a scoring input and then nine training inputs and a scoring input. Uh, and then uh, I can, um, once I get those uh, run holdout or learn, um, so I'm going to combine my, uh, my learn function and my holdout function together um, applicatively. Um, so conduit has a, uh, a notion of an applicative where I can do one thing or the other thing. Um, and then I can zip the results together and I can, at that point, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have uh, either a logging info or a scoring info. Um, once I have those things, um, I can put them back together by just going through each example that's an either. And so if it's a Scoring one, I'll, um, I'll update my scoring logger, and if it's a training one, I'll update my training logger. And I can um, uh, put those back together and do a, a, a and instead of an or, a tuple instead of an either. Um, and once I have that, I can, uh, here's the function that runs the whole thing, and I promised you uh, that I would uh, at least show you how the bracket works. Um, so here's that bracket back from my slide four. Uh, and, and so um, what am I doing? I'm, I'm finally passing an actual C. So this is like the first time in like all these slides that you've actually seen a model configuration. It's been entirely implicit everywhere else. And in the, in the way that I get Haskell to do all the type inference for me is just this one little type application right here. Uh, and so uh, what's going on here? Uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, create a function that, that takes the um, actual data and um, it pipes it into this um, complex sequence of trains and learns that I created. Um, and then it pipes the result into uh, last, which simply is going to um, give me a maybe uh, of the um, final logging item if everything went well. If it gives me a nothing, something went horribly wrong, I can uh, just return nothing or, or fail. Right? Um, and now uh, I can uh, put all of this inside of a, an elastic MapReduce job um, and uh, do something like a fairly complex hyperparameter search where, you know, maybe I, my, my model's configuration space is, you know, 10 dimensions and each dimension I want to carve up 100 ways. Uh, and so, you know, that'll give me um, uh, a thousand different hyperparameter points and I want to um, spit them all out to different reducers and have each reducer run this code and train it on that particular set of hyperparameter points and write out a thousand models to S3. Um, and I can do that for um, TensorFlow models, I can do that for VW models, I can do that for uh, supervised learning models, uh, reinforcement learning models using fairly, um, uh, I guess I would say like mainstream uh, Haskell type system tricks. Um, so that's, that's it in a nutshell. Um, I'm sorry I went through that very fast. I didn't want to take too, too long, but uh, you can uh, uh, read a lot more about the, the different patterns that, that uh, we used um, in the at the end. Um, that's it. Yeah. Any questions for Chris? All right. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, I think, do we have space for nine, which is in five minutes, or do we have it longer? Do you have any 